Welcome to the Better Human Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stuckert. Better human means bettering yourself, the world, those around you, and leaving a better world for you having been there. That's our answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? Well, it's about the journey, not the destination. It's about betterment, constantly improving. It's about the mastery of yourself, your emotions, your life, and all the fun, cool shit that goes along with that. Today, we're going to talk about one big idea, but before I get to that big idea, I'm simplifying things. I'm always changing things. I'm always trying to keep you on your toes. If you're following along and you have been, I appreciate that for sure. I know I was talking about carnivore diet and health and a lot of that stuff. That stuff will come up from time to time, but I'm mostly focused on bigger ideas, mindset, a little bit of finance, a little bit of sovereignty, and generally whatever is going to help you become a better, safer, more sovereign, free, critical thinking human. That's going to actually manifest in something like health or diet or nutrition, right? What I've found is that the people that get it, they get it. The people that can master themselves and do the work, they do the work. So I can tell them what to do, what to eat, what not to eat, and they'll do it. But everyone else, they don't need how-to information. They need to understand what holds them back from just taking the action in the first place. That's what they need to really work on. And that's why I've shifted out of a lot of the kind of how-to content because a ton of people are doing that. You can find YouTube videos for all this stuff. You can find papers and podcasts and whatever. But you're going to come here to become a better human. Sometimes I'm going to talk about money. Sometimes I'm going to talk about finance. Oh, well, that is money. Sometimes I'm going to talk about sovereignty, freedom. I might even talk about like capitalism, collectivism, politics. I'll talk about books. I'll talk about mindset, big ideas. I might remind you to stick to the basics of health, etc. So if a show you come across doesn't really appeal to you, then just wait till tomorrow. Something else will come. I'll be posting daily. I might eventually move to posting more than that just because I have so much to say and there's so much to cover. But it's all going to go to one feed. One email list, one newsletter, Colin.coach to get the Better Human newsletter, and it's one podcast network. Today, we're talking about this idea that when you have a lot of people, and I've been thinking about this idea similar to Dunbar's number, which is based on the 150 number. It's studied in business, they've studied this, in groups, in uh, towns, and things like that. There's a lot of research around this, and it's based on our ancestral past. The theory of some of the, I guess you could say anthropologists, paleontologists, uh, I guess Dunbar was probably one of those. He, or it might've been a she, I don't actually know, figured out that it was likely that you never had a group of humans that could grow beyond 150 num- uh, people because then breakdown of relationships and familiarity and like understanding social d- dynamics would break down. And this also aligns a lot with the theory of the human brain and how it grew Uh, The theory is basically to be able to be better at relationships and keeping track of kind of tit for tat and reciprocity and, you know, gossip and these different things that were very important to having a bunch of mixed sex, mixed age homo sapiens living together as a tribe. I mean, think about how hard it is with like even a semi-large family, like you could say 10 to 20 people. It's probably a shit show half the time. Now imagine taking that to a level of 50, 75, 100, or even 150, you get these little tribalistic sects that that brew up and these little things where you got to choose a side and this person and that person and you, and you get rifts and you get all kinds of stuff that can happen. And that's not really conducive for the group to survive in the wild. If you have people that are hoarding resources, if you have people that are doing things to sabotage someone else, this could put everybody at risk. So it's really fascinating if you want to understand like Dunbar's number and how the human brain can kind of only keep track of a certain amount of things. I think even Facebook has data on this or we've studied data where it's about 150 people that you'll be able to have on Facebook that you can kind of even know who they are. Anything above that you can't really keep track of. I bring that up because I believe that in our modern world, there's probably an inflection point where if you take 10 million people, maybe it's 20 million, maybe it's more than five. When you start entering the mainstream of things where a lot of people, and I'm using America as an example, when a lot of people believe something or think something, you actually get a distortion of truth and... What I found is the more people believe something, the less likely it is to be right. And even if it is in the realm of right, it's missing a ton of context and it's probably taken out of context a lot and used and weaponized in ways that it shouldn't be. Vaccines, for example. I'm gonna get into a couple examples here. I didn't even wanna bring that up, but that just kind of came to mind. But it's interesting that that is the case. Why the more people that kind of adopt a belief or idea, why is it that more people means less likely to be true and or severely lacking in context and extra information. It's very fascinating. And maybe someday somebody will write a book on this or study this or something. Uh, Maybe we'll have enough data with social media. I don't know, but it is very fascinating nonetheless. And here are a few examples here. And then I'll probably have, and then I'll kind of have a takeaway 
about how to think about this and how you can use this. So the first example is nutrition. All the experts for years have been telling you animals are bad for you, eat plants, this is the best diet, you know, have a food pyramid with grains and these other highly refined, you know, carb dense foods, calorie dense foods, right? Which happen to make up the bulk of processed food, mind you. And that's supposed to be better. You're supposed to limit your fats, supposed to limit your animal proteins, eat a lot of vegetables, and you'll be healthy, health, and you'll be healthy, happy, and look fit. Yet nobody that follows that is happy, healthy, or looks fit. The reality is most people should be eating a lot of animal foods, mostly animal foods, then fruits and veggies and whatever. And honestly, anything and then anything else if they're prepping at home and not buying it from a big corporation. So for years, fat, cholesterol have been demonized, salt even has been demonized. And what we found is that these foods are actually the most important things you should be eating. Protein, fat, and the nutrients you get from animal foods and salt are actually the most important nutrients you need to eat. But guess what? The companies that benefit from eating more fat and salt and animal foods are usually small, low margin businesses. They don't have a lot of money for lobbying. They don't have a lot of money for marketing. But what companies do? Processed food companies, fast food companies, etc. Which is why you see that most of what the food pyramid recommends happens to coincide with the foods that are mostly processed and sold by the big corporations that spend billions of dollars in lobbying. And this is what I call an accidental conspiracy. It didn't start out this way, but different market forces, different opportunities, different trends in society made it so that processed food grew. People wanted cheap, convenient food that grew and grew and grew. Those dollars were then helped to funnel funding and research and colleges and American Heart Association, all these things. And then now you have this system where the status quo is based on billions and billions of dollars. Everybody has their hand in the pie. Everyone's making money in some way. And nobody wants to admit that they've been wrong for 40, 50 years because they're propping up a broken system. Politics, here's another example. So what we're seeing in our modern two-party system in America is this idea that it's about our side versus your side. It's not about whether government should have more or less power, which that should be the real question. Nobody talks about, should we actually reduce government, limit government, limit regulation, do less things, repel things, let the free market do its thing, let people live free. Instead, it's Democrats are better, Republicans are better. I'm going to do more things and give you this and give you that and benefit this or whatever. The entire discussion is actually, <laughs> it, it's obviously a power grab, but the entire discussion and even the voters are being duped by the fact that all everyone's talking about is more government. But what we need to be doing is having less government, period. This brings us to the ideas of collectivism, which obviously coincides. Maybe it's another accidental conspiracy, but as government's gotten bigger and as the spectacle of government has gotten bigger, people have become more polarized. Uh, they've adopted more ideas like socialism and Marxism and communism and all these collectivist ideas that are basically like, oh, well, rich are bad and, and we need to save the poor and we need to invest in this and we need to do that. And basically the entire idea of collectivism is around this idea that one man should basically tell another how to live and how to use his or her property, right? That's all it is. Anybody that tries to defend this, they will skate around this simple first principle, collectivism in any way, socialism, communism, Marxism, fascism, no matter what it is, all these things are, they are using violence, right? And having a monopoly on violence, which the government does and saying, I'm gonna take from you and yeah, that's what taxes are, take it from you and I'm gonna distribute it to someone else. I don't even get into the absurdity that is income tax and anything like that. But this is one of those things, again, it's like people think that socialism is good or paying for the poor is good or this or that. And they actually don't really understand what they're talking about. They don't understand the history of any of these things. They don't understand how they don't actually work. And they don't understand, which is the really unfortunate thing, is how an actual free market brings more prosperity to all and solves the very things that government sets out to do. And people think, oh, that's not possible. When does government do anything well? When does government make anything better? And they might think they solve one problem with this and they write some law for this and then whack-a-mole, there's 10 other things that need solving. And that's why government continually creeps more power, more power, more regulation, more regulation, and eventually everything will be illegal. We will all have thought crimes for even thinking something or whatever. And it will be 1984. And that's why America is heading toward a dystopian future. And it's either going to it's just very lucky to blow itself up. Like there's going to have to be some kind of major correction. I don't know what that's going to be. I hope it's not a bloody civil war, but 
something's going to have to give. And this is just unfortunately the reality of government. Governments get power and then they get more power and they don't ever give up power. And it's just a never ending thing of Frankenstein growing. You know, he's been released in the wild. And he's going to keep growing and gobbling and he cannot stop. And that's what governments are. Here's another one before I let you go. Uh, blame the rich. The idea that rich people are bad. This one really gets to me, uh, especially when you understand capitalism, money, when you understand what governments do, how actually bad and dangerous they are. And not even because people are nefarious or want to do bad. Most people in government want to do good. It's the system. It's the incentives. It's unfortunately the idea that like one person or small group of people know better than you. There's always going to be a loser in that situation, which is why government should be as small as possible and mostly just to protect very basic personal property rights. But the idea of blaming the rich is insane. You want to have the richest people on the planet in your country because that means you have the freest country in the world. When you have billionaires, this is a feature of society. It's not a bug. If you remove the opportunity to become a billionaire, you are putting artificial constraints and you are giving up and removing freedoms and removing opportunity. You're actually more likely to have racism and prejudice and unequal opportunity. That's just so crazy. It's like the very people that want to blame the rich are also the people that probably want to talk about Black Lives Matter or want equality for all. The way to have equality for everyone is to mean that one person can become a billionaire, one can fail or whatever. But the reality is even when you become a billionaire and you have poor people, poor people rise up. You know, billionaires make things better, innovation, technology, better roads, stronger this, do that, whatever. Everything grows as a result. You want more billionaires. You want as many freaking billionaires as possible. As long as they're operating in free market. The danger of billionaires and government, or really anybody with power and influence and politicians, is when you have big government. Because then if you're a billionaire, you can use that money and you can continually make things more favorable for you. But like the truly free market billionaires that are just creating companies and are making their money, like Bezos or Musk, or whatever, from creating value, and that, you know, are generally not that involved in politics. Versus like the Russian oligarchs that their entire money is based on monopoly power and by cozying up to government. Like you don't want the Russian uh, oligarch type of situation, but you want the free market American, yeah, build something, give people what they want, and you should make as much money as freaking possible. So here's one quote from a book I'm reading about. The book's called Trust Us, We're Experts. And it's just like example after example of corporate and like nonprofit and public health advisor involvement and it's insanity, but this goes on broad daylight. Most people don't care. They don't know or whatever. Uh, and then I'm going to give you the final call to action for what this is all about, why you should even care. So corporate sponsors have formed partnerships with a number of leading nonprofit organizations in which they pay for the right to use the organization's names and logos in advertisements. Bristol Myers Squibb, for example, paid $600,000 to the American Heart Association for the right to display the AHA's name and logo in ads for its cholesterol lowering drug, Pravacol. The American Cancer Society reeled in $1 million from Smith Klein Beekman for the right to use its logo in ads of BCAM's Nicoderm CQ and Nicorette anti smoking AIDS. And Johnson Johnson subsidiary counter by shelling out 2.5 million for similar rights from the American Lung Associations and its ads for Nicotrol, a rival nicotine patch. This is just nicotine. Now, some people will say, oh, well, that's not that bad because we want to quit, have people quit smoking. Sure. But when you realize that these same organizations get way more money from actually food lobbying and nutrition-based lobbying and labeling and all this crap, then you should see the real problem. And then you should ask yourself, why is corn, wheat, and soy the most subsidized crops, which no farmer would actually farm generally based on the pricing. Uh, they're not very profitable. And most farmers that grow them are not profitable without the government giving them money. That means that their entire profit structure for their farming enterprise is based on a check coming from the government that's guaranteed. All they got to do is produce low quality stuff, sell to food companies, and they get their check. The big food companies, Kellogg, cereal, bar makers, whatever, sugar, et cetera, they're going to always be lobbying to make sure that those subsidies stay in place so that those farmers will keep producing their poison plant foods. Literally, it's as simple as that. And it's now this conspiracy where it's all held together. And then it's basically, and it's basically propped up 
with this idea that grains are at the bottom or that fat in animal foods and cholesterol is bad for you. Demonize the thing that's good for you so we can sell you the thing that's not. It's kind of insane. And when you dive into things like this and you become a first principles thinker and you think about history, you really start opening your eyes to everything. And that's what really where the call to action comes in today. The call to action is, why are you listening to that politician? Why are you trusting anything the government says or does? And then a question I would challenge you if you are into politics or you watch the news or anything like that. When was the last time you took a candidate that you were voting for or you were supporting? Let's say that person got in office. Have you gone back to the campaign trail of the promises that he or she made? And then have you now checked whether they've done these things that they said they were going to do? Have you followed up with if they've changed their tune or not, what they're harping on now, etc.? That it would be a feedback loop that almost nobody pays attention to. And that's why it's so easy to dupe the public because they have such a short attention span and they just want to be sold talking bits and headlines and whatever. And they want to think, oh, that person's good. This person's bad. I'm a Democrat. They're a Republican or vice versa. And it's just tribalistic crap, not based on actual reality. And it's not based on results. And that's why politicians and politics in general, such a corrupt crony game because they don't have to get results. They just have to talk a bunch of shit. <laughs> it's insane. But when you start realizing that the more people that believe something, the more likely they are to be held sway through mainstream media and the government, which controls the narrative, that's why it's more likely to be wrong. Because these artificial narratives that aren't based on economic fact or reality or what's good or what's not, there's no feedback loop there. And so all it is, is talking points, sound good on camera, get reelected, or get out of office and make a bunch of money while I'm in office. Corrupt, broken, ineffective system that this is just one example. I won't even get into fiat or dollars or whatever. Buy Bitcoin, that's the answer. <laughs> this stuff goes on in broad daylight. And most people don't have the time. They don't care. They don't want to. I mean, they feel maybe they feel helpless. But the reality is we're all capable of doing something. Stop watching the news. Stop clicking on those sensationalist headlines. Stop even listening to or supporting uh, politicians or whatever. When the culture of politics and politicians and even things like celebrity culture, when that stuff eventually dies out, I hope it does, when that stuff dies out, these people will lose their power. And a lot of these accidental conspiracies will lose their power and they will have to come crumbling down simply because the incentives will no longer be there. And what will happen is we will have a better world, we'll have more equality, we have more healthier humans and healthier children, and we will be living closer to the truth. And that's what I hope for my son's generation. I hope for everybody. Get in the Better Human newsletter. And if you want to support the show, check out one of our favorite sponsors. I got them here in the video. We got Wild Foods Co. Use code WOWCEO for 15% off your order. Better foods and subs for better humans. Swan Bitcoin, that's how I buy Bitcoin. The lowest fees in the biz. You can get that over at colin.coach slash swan. And if you want to find out where I get my meat, colin.coach slash meat and my fish column.coach slash fish support these approved companies with integrity that produce high quality products. And that can be it. I'll see you in the next one.